Welcome to Understand Murdoch, a podcast from The Post and Courier, South Carolina's largest newspaper. Our award-winning reporters have spent more than a year digging into the Murdoch saga to bring you the latest news and in-depth analysis as we cover the story of drugs, deceit, and death in South Carolina's rural low country. And now we're here to provide quick daily updates on Alec Murdoch's highly anticipated double murder trial in Colleton County. I'm Eric Russell here with Jocelyn Greshik, who is on the ground in Walterboro covering the Alec Murdoch trial for us. And we are back with another episode of the podcast after a little break. And jurors also came back today after a long weekend and heard testimony from a very highly anticipated witness. Jocelyn, can you walk us through what happened today in the courtroom? Sure. So Buster Murdoch was the first witness to take the stand today, and he is the 26-year-old remaining child of Alec Murdoch, so he'd be the son of Maggie and older brother of Paul. And so he's been around uh, the trial so far, but this is his first time being center stage, right? Yeah, yeah. He's been at the trial just about every day. So he and his long-term girlfriend, Brooklyn White, have been in the courtroom, I think, nearly every day of testimony. I don't believe they attended jury selection, and they also weren't present for most of the in-camera hearings, which, remember, was that testimony about Ellick's alleged financial crimes uh, heard without jurors. Okay. And one of the things I find interesting about Buster is he's someone who we haven't really heard from in the public throughout this entire saga. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. Um, You know, Alex Brothers went on national TV in the wake of Maggie and Paul's death, sort of to speak on behalf of the family. And I know one of the brothers, John Marvin Murdoch and his wife, Liz, have since spoken on the record with the Post and Courier. But Sort of like Maggie's extended family, Buster has kept mostly out of the public eye in the wake of the killings. Um, Portions of calls with his father from jail have come out, and some media outlets also published photos of Buster in Las Vegas and at the family's Edisto Beach House. And then Buster also put out a joint statement with Alec offering a reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the double homicides. But other than all that, he's really stayed silent throughout this whole saga. Okay. And and while I say he, he's been out of the attention so far, he did come into focus during the trial recently for his behavior in the courtroom. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Sure. So Alec, along with their other extended family members, have often been seen or photographed crying at various points throughout the trial. But I don't believe Buster ever has. And there's been a lot of conversation about that and focus on that and sort of his overall demeanor among people who, you know, are tuning in to watch the trial from their TV or computer or whatever. And I think it's natural to be curious about what Buster has to say and how he acts during all this. But I also think, you know, it's important to keep in mind that this is someone who's suffered such a great amount of loss. His mother and brother were brutally killed and his father is on trial for their murders while also facing, you know, a litany of other criminal charges. And people have different responses to trauma and very different ways of showing their emotion. So I think we have to remember that too, for as much as we, you know, want to call out his supposed demeanor or reaction, I guess. Yeah, definitely a complex situation. With all of that in mind, what did he actually say in his testimony and what did he tell jurors? Well, I think his testimony really helped bolster the defense's case, which wasn't necessarily surprising since they were the ones to call him, you know, as their witness. I think he offered some explanations of Alec's questionable behaviors on the night of June 7th and in the days that followed. What were some of the examples of him explaining that? Well, for one, Buster testified that both of his parents typically use the main gate to enter and exit Moselle. So Remember, there are two entrances to the property, one by the dog kennels and then the official entrance, which is marked with 
two brick pillars. Prosecutors have shown Alec used the main entrance each of the four times he entered and exited Moselle the day of the killings, even to visit his mom's house late that night, despite knowing Maggie was down at the kennels and she wasn't responding to his calls or texts. And what about Almeida, where Alex's parents live? I know prosecutors showed last week that Alex's car had pulled around to the back of the house, I believe, near a wood line when he arrived. Yeah, that was another interesting point. Buster said this was also very typical for family members, particularly if they were entering the house through its back door. They just pull off the main driveway and park around back. And so was there was also a phone call made from Alec to Buster on the drive to Almeida, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did he say anything about that? Yeah. So Alec called Buster around 9.10 that night, which would have been a few minutes after he drove out of Moselle. Buster said his dad seemed normal on the phone and explained he was going to Almeida. And Buster also said that that didn't seem like an unusual trip for his dad to make. You know, he'd often go visit his parents. In terms of other things that uh, may have been brought up, did uh, defense attorneys bring up Alex's opioid addiction at all? Yeah, they did. And Buster said he had known about it well before Alec publicly disclosed his struggles, which would have been in September 2021 after being fired from his law firm. So Buster said he knew his mom and brother had found pills at some point and confronted Alec about it. He apparently had even checked into a detox center after Christmas all the way back in 2018. But Paul and Maggie found pills a few more times after that, apparently, and Alec did some at-home self-detoxes. And so after this, Buster said he just assumed, you know, his dad had beat his addiction. All right. Um, I know we just mentioned... Alec had called Buster earlier the night of June 7th before he discovered Maggie and Paul's bodies. Did Buster say anything after he found out they'd been killed? Yeah, so Buster got to Moselle late that night. He said Alec was destroyed and heartbroken and that he was crying and couldn't really speak. Buster said they spent the night at his grandparents' house in Almeida, but before they left Moselle, Buster had helped Alec pack meaning he would have been inside his dad's closet, grabbing shirts and shorts off the shelves. And then the next day, Buster said he, Alec, and Brooklyn all came back to Moselle and apparently took showers there. So that's interesting. How how does that help the defense? Well, the family's former housekeeper, Blanca Simpson, previously testified that she also came to Moselle sometime the day of June 8th. And She noticed a puddle of water next to Alec's shower, as well as a damp towel and some clothing that had been left on the floor and in the closet. And so without this context from Buster, you know, I think someone could have concluded the killer had cleaned themselves up in the shower. And, you know, that's why there's this puddle and the damp towel and stuff like that. Okay, got it. Um, And were there any other noteworthy things from Buster's testimony? Yeah. So one other interesting thing that defense attorneys asked Buster about was whether he took any safety precautions in the wake of the killings. You know, we've heard testimony from other witnesses about how worried they were for members of the Murdoch family, especially in summer 2021, since they didn't know if they were being targeted at that point. But Buster said he didn't want to carry a gun or hire a private security detail to follow him around or anything like that. He was either staying at hotels at the time or at his girlfriend's family's house, which he said had security cameras and an alarm system. So he felt safe. All right. And did prosecutors ask Buster about anything new? Yeah, I think a couple of things. So John Metters, one of the prosecutors, asked him whether his mom had planned to stay at the Edisto Beach house the night she was killed. Previous witnesses, including Maggie's sister, testified Alec had specifically asked her to go back to Moselle that night since his father's health was deteriorating. But Buster said he didn't know what his mom's plan was that night, and call records show that they had spoken on the phone at least once that day. 
And then we also know from those phone calls recorded in jail between Alec and Buster that Alec had asked him at one point whether he wanted to go back to Moselle and I think hunt or something. And Metters sort of asked him about this and if Buster had ever returned to the place his mom and brother died. Buster said he had, but never to spend the night. But Buster also testified the same of Alec. Neither of them ever spent another night at Moselle after the killings. Okay, and we heard from one other witness today. Um, what can you tell us about their testimony? Yeah, so defense attorneys also called up an expert that they had hired to analyze Maggie and Paul's deaths. His name is Mike Sutton, and he's a forensic engineer at a North Carolina-based company. And he primarily investigates and analyzes accidents and failures in civil litigation. He primarily investigates and analyzes accidents involved in civil litigation, but Judge Clifton Newman qualified him as an expert witness in several areas, including shooting incident reconstruction. Did Sutton have any formal firearms training? No, and this was a huge thing prosecutors emphasized during their cross-examination. Sutton said he's never taken a class in shooting incident reconstruction, nor does he have any related certifications. But it's worth noting that while prosecutors harped on this, they did have the chance to object to Sutton being an expert witness before he started testifying, and no one did. Okay, that's interesting. Um, wh and what did Sutton conclude about Maggie and Paul's deaths? I think the most consequential takeaway is that Sutton believes Alec couldn't have been the one to fire at least one of the shots that went through a quail cage found near Maggie's body. Based on his calculations of the angle and trajectory of the bullet, that shooter would have been about five foot two and holding the rifle in line with their hip. Just for context, Alec is pretty tall, correct? Yeah, he is. Sutton said he's about six foot four. So for Alec to have made this particular shot, Sutton said he would have had to have held the rifle at or below his kneecap. And of course, that just doesn't really seem possible. Um, but again, neither prosecutors nor defense attorneys really ask Sutton about other scenarios, like whether the shooter could have been kneeling or crouched or maybe even lying down. That's all we have for now. For more in-depth coverage of this trial, as well as the latest news on the Murdoch story at large, stay tuned to postandcourier.com slash Murdoch. You can find us on Twitter at Post and Courier. We would love if you could send questions, feedback, and tips to our Murdoch email address. That's Murdoch at postandcourier.com. And please also take a minute to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to keep up to date on the trial, subscribe to Murdoch News, a premium newsletter from the Post and Courier, bringing you exclusive first-hand insight from local South Carolina reporters who have covered this saga from the beginning. Subscribe at postandcourier.com slash Murdoch News, and we'll bring you exclusive reporting on the civil and criminal cases of Alec Murdoch. We'll see you next time.